how you really start to see lighting. And so when you don't have light, you create your own light. Yeah. Um, okay. Photosymposium gives me a big exposure on what is out there, how what people are doing with regards to photography expos uh, exhibitions and photo books and all that. Um, and why that's uh, very good because you start to get exposed to work of different people. And this is where I got exposed to work by Daido Morima, uh, Rinko Kawachi. Uh, check out those work. Uh, they are very different from what I used to take, and I really take my hats off to them. The, the vision they have in that, and then got me into photo books, and so uh, so then I start to collect some of these books. Uh, I well, one of my fan of course is Sebastio Segaldo. Uh, you can look at his work. Uh, brilliant black and white, very detailed uh, documentary of migrants, and uh, you know, and uh, he did a work for UNESCO uh, called Genesis, which is very much related to nature. And yeah, so that was my inspiration. Uh, Michael Kenna, forms of Japan, very Zen, and so you know, so you know, when I go out, some of his work I can relate to it, and so I collect those. Um, <coughs> and then uh, I went for the. Uh, Photo editing workshop by Wubin. Uh, so another thing that really pushes me out of my comfort zone. Uh, it's not only about taking photos, but know how to edit it. Not as in using Photoshop, but really putting it out so that you edit your story of how you want to share it with your audience. Yeah, how you create that uh, that experience for your audience. And. Um, now I've mentioned here pics of Asia. Now a lot of us go for photo tours, and what happens? We go to photo tours, they get all these models, or they take this place, everything is set up, then everybody takes, and no cameras getting all the way, and then come back. You see, I don't know, my photo are I put up on Facebook. Next thing is you get, you know, fifty others or hundred others, almost the same angle, right? What is the value of the photo? Now, um, with this pics of Asia, Etienne, uh, you all might have a chance to meet him when he comes. Uh, James was with me on the workshop. A few of our Penang uh, friends are here. Who been? It was really an experience because he takes you to a place and he says, "Okay, you go to this market. This is what you can shoot. You shoot. That's it." And we all go around on our own and we shoot and we came back with different photos. Then he says, "Okay, come sit down. He go through your photo and he will tell you what you're good at. If you're really good, he says you're good. I like this, this, this." All this, you know, can you shoot differently? On the last day, all of us given an assignment, go and pick a topic, shoot, come back with one to five photographs, tell your story. Right? And then when we go back to Hai An, all of us submit ten photos and we do a critique of the photos. So that was a very great format. Yeah. That you go there, you don't just take now everybody comes and yes, you, you get guaranteed photos, but what value are those photos? What have you learned? Yeah, because the thinking has all been done for you. But when you go for this, you have to think, you get pushed, you get told off. Ah, these photos, why you take like this? Right? In a nice way, yeah, but you learn. Right? And then they tell you your angles. Your photos are all like this. And one thing you find out is that we all have our comfort zone. If you look at go back and look at our photos, you find that we all shoot from probably a very fixed angle. All the photos is either at this level or that, or just a few, not much variation. So when we start to realize that, we start to say, okay, next round is I'm not going to take all these photos. Then we push ourselves off the zone, and that is why this workshop I strongly recommend that. Okay, then of course. Um, here, you, I will then share with you the two exhibitions, the, the videos. Um, and now, my exhibition would not have happened without the support of James and the encouragement of James. It was James. Uh, we went for the trip to Kenya, right? Uh, and so, when I was there, I didn't know that he was actually talking to me, but he was also sizing me up. <laughs> So he asked me questions like, okay, Barry, how do you take your photo? So innocently, I just answer, you know, I, um, I look at the thing and then I kind of frame what I want to take, right? Have an idea what I want, then I go and take the photo. So it's a thought, 
The thought process comes first before taking the photo. It's not snap, 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 then go back and say, oh, this one is nice, huh? oh, this is nice. Huh? No. Yeah? It's about thinking about, okay, uh, this is the whole scene I'm in, this is the environment. Then, like, uh, I was just having some conversations with my friends. Is, first thing is, it comes from here first for me. Having a feel for the place, the environment, the story, uh, how it relates to me, and then once I connect with that, um, once you have that connection, uh, then you're in the zone. And when you're in the zone, the photos come out. Um, so James spoke to me, uh, went through the photos, then he says, Barry, don't worry, I'll make sure you know uh, it happens well, and go for it. And so I had my first exhibition with 30 photos. Out of that 30 photos, two, I slipped in two landscape photos, black and white, with Jim's support um, at Ellen's place. Yeah. So, and through that journey, I had lots of support from uh, uh, Mark, who, uh, you know, that's where I learned about why the printing is so important. Um, and Ellen, uh, you know, the, the space and all that arrangements, and of course, uh, Milling and uh, James has been uh, very uh, supportive in making sure that you know I, I get things right uh, as well in terms of the whole thing about putting up an exhibition. So now, because I'm not going to go through a photo, I just want you to just kind of open up your mind and then just look at this photo. Now, this set of photos is about rescued elephants. Yeah. So uh, the elephants in encroach into human area, and so there was this human elephant conflict space all the time and very often it's we as human beings we always claim supremacy we saw our rights our land you have invaded my land but rightly it's actually the land belongs to them or they share this land with us right and they are being very innocent because we start to build our things here and claim it's ours and then they come in unknowingly and then we say you know they are destroying our things so that was this conflict that is still happening now the thing is that the elephant village, they really put in a lot of effort um, to rescue the elephants. So, I mean, the stories they tell me, of course, I, I, I'm not there long enough to verify. But each elephant comes in, it's really very badly beaten, um, very sick, and some almost die. And they had to fly in a doctor from Thailand and really treat these elephants. So I have people who really question me, Barry, why are you showing this work? You know, you know they are mistreating elephants. Elephants should be free. They should be free to grow. They should not be in these parks. And all. So there are people who really challenge this. It's a good controversial topic and gets people talking, something to think about. But what I saw was different because I saw the way the, the, the owner was there and how all the elephants go and hug him, you know, put a trunk around his head and hug him. He could just lie on the back of the elephant. And I also saw the relationships about how the mahouts were with the elephant. So, so we went there, a group of us, we went shooting, but later in the day when they had another round of uh, bathing, I went back on my own. It was only me and April, right? And that's where the magic happened. Then, because there was, there was no distraction, and we were, I was in the, you know, the, the mahouts just go into the water with the elephants. That's when, so you saw really the bonding. So what I always see is you see the pictures of the mahouts and try and get a sense of the bonding of the elephants with the mahouts. They were just doing their stuff. So that's what they do normally every day without any spectators. Right? And uh, when I look up at one point, I saw, I didn't tell them to pose for me, yeah? but I see a row of 12 elephants and one of the elephants was blowing the water out in there. And that was what they were just rehearsing for one of the shows, in the water, of course. So, to me, this magic moment happens, not because we, you know, because if I asked them to pose for me, it would have been a very, very different thing. The other thing, uh, when I was there, is I wanted to show, you know, the, the majesty and grandness of this big, I mean, these animals are huge, and they're so powerful. I want to bring that to the public. Um, because we don't understand them, and some of them, when some people look at them, they get very scared. They can be very scared. They are very powerful. I stand next to one of them, the ear open, I was pushed a few feet away. Right. 
So to really get a sense of being so close to this animal and really feel how grand and majestic and how beautiful these animals are, right, these fellow beings are, it's really a great feeling and that's what I want to capture it in my photo. So every time I look at my photo now, I have one uh, about that size, maybe a bit smaller, on my wall at home. And every day I go back, I look at the elephant and he looks at me and we kind of greet one another. <laughs> uh, but it's, you know, it just brings me back to Kenya, and that's one of the things about the photo. It's the photo that makes you feel something every time you look at it. And that's, that's, and so look at this, and then when we go to the wisteria, I will explain again, yeah? So, let's go to this now. So I hope you get the feeling. If you have any further questions on the photos, you can ask me. You know, because I think all of you can also do that. I suppose you know, take these photos. It's just how you trans transform your feelings into your photos. Um, the last photo was quite controversial, and uh, in fact, uh, when uh, Prof uh, Aru came to see uh, and a team of other people, they they had some questions, and I had someone who says. When they saw the photo of elephant with a chain, someone commented, Oh no, why is the elephant in chains? And then there are people who ask me, Barry, why don't you Photoshop the chains away? Um, the reason I did it is because that's where, you know, that's what it is. That's, it kind of defines the human conflict. Uh, you know, the question about, do we put them in a park or do we release them, right? And, and we also had uh, someone from uh, MNS came and talked about because she was actually the ones who, who did a lot of uh, tracking of elephants and conservation and she came and talked about it and asked her this question. Uh, the thing is, where do you draw the line? Do we keep them or do we put them out there? Now if we put them out there, do we have the place for them? Malaysia is not a big country and the fact is unfortunately our forest is being cut by highways and very time, uh, many times if you look at the MNS to post things some very beautiful animals are killed, grow killed uh, because of cars banging into them. Because they are just trying to go from one side to another and not knowing anything that there's a big car or car coming at them. So it kind of defines that we must be, we can live with these animals if we learn how to. Rest.
progress back then. And uh, how I was able to take this progress is because I still hold a lot of respect for them. And, you know, understand the nature that you don't just go there and go wild and then, you know, try and do all funny things with them. But you maintain the respect, you maintain the... Somehow when you start to connect emotions with them, somehow I can feel something for them. And I think they feel something for me. You see some of the pictures, they're very playful. They really kind of, you know, the one that the truck is there, there when you go near, they really kind of put up the water and kind of show you something. So they are trying to show how proud they are, that they can do things. And I think that connection is important, and the chain kind of defines it. That yes, they are sleeping there and they are chained up, but what solution do we have? If we really want to solve the problem, do something yourself. Right? It's not for me to do it. That's what I want to share. Okay, then uh, no, we are going to go to the Ubisteria. So after the elephants, um, when I went to Japan, you know, Japan is known for Sakura. By the time that I go there, Sakura season is almost over. So it's a late room Sakura, it's not the early room. And uh, then I start to research and say, okay, what else can I shoot in Japan? Then I saw this place uh, called uh, Ashikagai. It's about an hour away from uh, Japan, uh, from Tokyo, sorry. Uh, I have to take two trains, uh, walk uh, almost one and a half kilometers. Um, that time when the, in Japan, when the flowers are in full bloom, the, park, the park price is the highest as well. Uh, on the third leg of the journey, you pack in a train like a starting camp with all the people, the tourists and Japanese. Um, so I went all the way there, but it was really worth it. I spent a whole day there from morning until evening. Uh, I would have spent a few more hours if my sister didn't come along. <laughs> uh, but I realized she was tired, and so, you know. And, um, so in the evening, I managed to grab a few shots, and then we went off. Um, now, the thing about Wisteria, it's uh, not an easy flower to shoot because it comes in the bundles, right? And shooting individual flower, it's not a very nice shape. I don't know. I kind of don't connect with the shape. So I was shooting, and also, of course, there's a lot of people, right? You kind of get a bit distracted sometimes. I took, of course, the normal photos, the whole tree and all that. Then, as I shot, I went to those places where, you know, what did about the Japanese is nothing is left to chance. They really make sure they create that fantastic experience for you <laughs> when you go there. So when I saw the summer way they displayed the trees, um, I start to see things differently. If I look, if I step myself back and look at it as an art, as nature, they look like showers of spring, right? And it was springtime, and that's how I was feeling very, you know, bright and grey. You know, I was feeling it was like it was the first place I go after when I when I touched down. So the following day I went for this way. So I was really like really happy and so you know so you see the nature of the old bride they are very you know happiness is the word you know uh, it's so it's the showers of spring so the way I created them I try to make them look a bit like the rain the showers uh, then I start to take them more as an art form how I f it's actually how I feel about that so some I took it like showers some I took it when I look up they look to me like fireworks except they don't burn me, and they're like just a few feet away. So they're just like showers of flower fireworks coming down at me. Uh, when I saw some of them hanging uh, down, uh, in, when the lighting shine on them, they look like those crystal curtains, yeah? But they're natural crystal curtains. So those are like diamonds in the sky. So I think of Lucy, like the song is Lucy in the sky with diamonds. So I kind of relate to those, um, you know, so, and, and look at that. Uh, we, I saw this old tree, which is, um, a very old tree, and uh, so it's a tree, and because it's so old, the trunk needs to be supported by poles. And it's one tree, and then it spreads out almost the size of half, three quarter the size of this room. Spreads out, amazing tree. And then, so for me, that is grandeur. That is the, you know, you look at the trunk; it just defines the age, and you know, the maturity, and how much care people have taken into making sure that this tree survives, right? Um, a lot of trees in Malaysia, what happens is you see, you see after a while they get, I don't know, they just have no definition, even though it's a very old tree. But in Japan, 
um, every tree, they really, if you go to the park, every season you see the workers go to every single tree, trim the tree. So in, in summer, they will prepare the tree for autumn. In autumn, they will prepare the tree for winter. They actually protect the tree from the cold winter. They covered it up, they use wires and hold it so that it doesn't fall in the snow. And, you know, when the snow drops on it, it gets heavy, so it might just topple over. Right? And then in winter, they go and make sure they trim it nicely so that in spring, you get the most beautiful flowers. That to me is the art of conservation. Right? And we've got a long way to learn about that. Uh, yes, we love to see beautiful things. Uh, we love our flowers. We should be proud of flowers, but why are we not? Because nobody really makes that happen for us. We've got beautiful bougainvilleas. But look at the bougainvilleas that we grow here. Can you see any definition? We can't. Right? So if somebody can really do that for our bougainvilleas, for some of our flowers, I think we can have something like this here in the uh, That's how I feel about it. But the way I take these photos is just my feeling. So when you see this, um, photos try and catch the feeling of you know, really happiness and a bright sunny place and you know, uh, just enjoy the beauty of nature, uh, the wonders of nature that it brings to you uh, and the light that you see on a beautiful spring day. Um, so, my time is almost up, so I'm going to rush through this very quickly, but if you want to explore further, uh, then we can. Um, so, some of my lessons learned in this journey to, to become an art photographer is that, first thing, it's uh, what is your passion? I'll start with the why. Uh, you know. Why I do photography? Uh, if I can do anything, what would I do? And for me, I've somehow over this 30 over years, I find it was really photography. I've been like, doing photography whenever I have an opportunity. I never ever said no to photography. Now, why is it important to me? Um, photography defines me. It's an extension of myself, of how I see the world, how I relate to the world, how I connect with things and people. And so, and it's also a great way for me to relax. And so, what it does to me, and what in fact does my work for others, and over my journey, I find um, I can bring a lot of joy to my friends, um, to my viewers when they see the work. Um, I can bring a lot of amazement, of appreciation of what nature and the beauty of the world. So you can see, my theme is uh, I tend to be a bit more positive-minded in things. I try because there's a lot of photographs, a lot of people covering wars, and and you know all the things and those are their forte and they have the access, I don't have access. So so I make a decision myself, I want to be more positive. I want to bring spread more joy and cheer to the world to try and balance things out. So that we don't wake up every day and look at the news and say, oh you know, it's another shitty day, something can be bad somewhere. Or somebody mm -hmm. don't care for something. Um, so I think if you care, make a change yourself. Okay. Very quickly. So cultivating a patient now, reading is very important, uh, reading the work of many people. Uh, so I spent almost a year reading before I really got back into shooting. 
Um, so looking at work, understanding them, and uh, so I'm still collecting quite a. If you want some good reading list, come to me. Um, you know, and uh, those are inspiration. That help to expand. Follow people whose work inspires me. Uh, of course, you can see I uh, I mentioned a few names. Uh, Saul Letter is another one which I strongly recommend. I kind of can connect with him very much, very much like me, introvert. <laughs> Don't like much publicity, uh, but he's done a brilliant work. Uh, he's got a brilliant mind as an artist. Um, yeah, and of course, uh, people like, uh, you know, Alvin uh, Chimbun, uh, Jeremy Lee, who was a very good artist. So, and, uh, so I follow artists because their work inspires me. It, you know, you see the work, you see how they think differently as well. Um, so it's not just photographers. Uh, you can follow others as well. Uh, even um, singers and stuff like that. Yeah? Um, sometimes it's important, if you find that you're shooting the same thing and you're getting into a hitting a wall, then you have to take a break and kind of yourself some space to think about things, go and read a bit and then come back. Um, now one thing I know is that you don't shoot for others. Don't shoot your work for others to, and, and that, that ask people, oh how's my work? Really, you should be knowing what you do. Uh, shoot your work and then ask yourself, because normally why we're tougher on ourselves than others. Right? Sometimes you get a lot of feedback, people like, 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 great, you know. But really, ask the question people, what's so great about this work? Now, if they can tell you exactly, very clearly, give you very good critique, then you know that's good. But sometimes you don't. And sometimes you get some very random response. Somebody comes in, hey, you know, Barry, you know, the picture you take of me is so great because I look at it, I never buy it of it. That's all my turning point. And that to me is a very useful uh, feedback. But at the end of the day, is shoot for yourself. Understand what you do, what you want, what really drives you, what really excites you. Shoot for yourself. And then you can sustain that journey. Okay, um, competence and character. Uh, what I learned is not about the gear I want to use. Sometimes I shoot with my handphone, sometimes I shoot with my RX100, which is a one inch sensor. I still get beautiful photos. Yeah? Um, just that you need to know when is the, the time you use which camera and which gear. Um, it's not about beautiful pictures. I shot a very nice picture, I put it in front of a, a workshop, and uh, I was just told, oh, nice postcard, I put the sun. Yeah, uh, you can shoot a very nice picture. Then you, uh, like somebody told me, oh, I take your picture. I put in a, uh, I just scan it. There are a thousand other pictures in Google. So you can throw that picture away, honestly, because, right? How's the buyer going to decide whether yours is better or others is better? You're making it very tough for your buyer to decide because it's nothing unique. It doesn't define itself. Yeah. Um, so understanding what collectors are looking for. So. Yeah, follow some of the galleries, read about some of the gallery work and learn from it and try to understand what's happening to the art scene. Um, and then you define yourself, how you want to drive the art scene yourself. Yeah. Um, maintaining the public persona is very important. Uh, one way you can, we can test ourselves is go to Google, put your name in and see what comes out. Uh, in this world now with analytics, you leave a very lasting trail of what you put inside. The public page. So anything that you, you know, any rent you put, uh, which tells that you're a wacko, people will know, right? And many companies before they even hire you, they do a search of you and they'll know what you're up to when you're off work, right? So if you want to do wash dirty learning, do it wisely in private. Yeah. So that's what I can share with you. Uh, so for me, maintain my part. So you can see, I'm very. I don't post a lot of photos. Um, you know, and and I I think through and pick my photos. So if I go for a trip, like the last one in Hokkaido, I don't straight away put all my photos out. I staged it and I make sure. Okay, it has to build over a momentum. So Stephen, you are here, Stephen. Uh, Stephen Nam. Uh, Ah, right, thank you for your comment. You see, so he, he told me, and then, so he tells me what I've done is right, because he says, Barry, you know, every time you post your picture, it gets better and better. That's what you want to do, right? You stage it so that people, 
what happens is you, you create that draw, the people start to follow you and they say, hey, this work, it's, you know, I'm seeing different angles of it and it's, it's defining, it's a work that's some, some definition. Uh, so presenting my best work, so if you think the work is so-so, please keep it. That's how I will do it. Um, it. Because it doesn't define, it doesn't give me additional point to put it out. And I, I normally do that. Uh, for my work, so that's why I say sometimes you have to really have a feel for your work um, and do that. Yeah. Um, producing work that people care about. So, so this is goes back to the thing. Right? If you go to a, a place, a photo tour, and then you take pictures that a thousand pieces already, or every year, you know, they have to go, they do a trip, and then you have so many. It's okay to still go, but then tell yourself, I'm going there to. Proof that I can do something very different and significant and bring back and show people what I can do. That's fine. But then you don't stand in line with everybody and shoot. You come back with something the same. And then it's a waste of money, it's a total disappointment for yourself. That's my experience. Yeah. And last one. Um, now, this is very important. It's about the viewer experience. Uh, so when you put up a show for exhibition, it's engaging your viewers. Um, the presence, yeah? Um, mind share, that means when somebody look at your work, they must be able to, you know, they, they talk about it and it's always on their mind. The end-to-end -end experience, so it starts from the time they enter the exhibition until the time they leave. Yeah. And of course then, I don't mean, what you want to hope for is a conversion rate that does it end up in a sale for you yeah, and it's a whole package <coughs> right so I will not go further um, I bought some some of my prints which uh, during break time you can come have a look and uh, I've also did some prints just on the photo small uh, four, three R I think and I brought this as well as a dupe and I can tell you how do you engage your audience with just this and the photos so that is portable yeah and uh, so with that, thank you very much. I hope you got something about this. And, uh, okay, thank you, Barry. Uh, next person would be uh, Mr. K.F. Choi. Greetings and appreciation to MAPG, our principals, James Low and uh, Milik, and to all my colleagues here of uh, MAPG. A while ago, some time back, I had a conversation with an elder. We were run through some pictures of a magazine, and he asked me one question. He asked me one question that really posed me something to really ponder a while. He asked me about this picture. It is a black and white picture. What do you see of this picture? I mentioned to him, I see light. What do you see light in this picture? That captivates me from just a black and white picture. It creates the depth of the thought process that the person, the photographer or artist has rendered. The magazine is a photojournalistic magazine at that time. It's called The Life. Today, that magazine is gone, unfortunately. That started the uh, journey of my photography. And the elder is my grandfather. That was way back when I was eight years old. Today, I'm talking about photography to share with you. My name is Choi. Last year, I had my solo exhibition, Yudaina Yama Piga Chikawa 2017. It is in Hokkaido, relating to the uh, magnificence of uh, Hokkaido. Piga Chikawa is a very small town. 
But I went, uh, basically, a lot of people, they miss that place. They go up to Sapporo. So today, I'm going to share with you some of the pictures and my experiences of an artist as a photographer. Uh, this edition has actually uh, give me a lot of uh, fondness. Choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. I'm a retiree for nine years. At the moment, I'm just uh, spending my time doing photography. Um, what it takes to be an art photographer. As artists, culminating thought process is essence in art direction. Nonetheless, managing light plays a major over the same subject. To me, light is very important. When I go to a place to shoot, I do a off-site recce or off-site pre-visualization. It could be a rock that I'm looking for as a main subject. But eventually, when I'm, when I'm there, the rock may not be my main subject. It's where the light falls. That's what I'm trying to say. My aspect of engagement, the emotional tone, resonating to my five senses. That's very important to me, the five senses. The subject matter of each body of work determines the medium, a handcrafted photograph, from capture to print, connecting perception and interpretation, interacting the audience and artists. It's a state of mind. A picture is just a picture. It's how you relate, how you connect the picture to your audience, and how you try to relate the story to them is the perception of the art. Art, irrespective of genres, evolves in myriad forms. History translates the revolution of mixed conception as perceived by practicing artists. It doesn't matter what you shoot, you know, people may not uh, take in appreciation of your work. It doesn't matter, you are the artist. Do what you feel is right. In this respect, neither right or wrong, nor good or bad lies in grabs of the artist per se. Finale is its delivery. Whilst mutual integration of thoughts perceived by the audience and artist culminates the essence of art. So the most important thing is what are you trying to relate your picture to the audience? That is very important. Uh, my thought process is basically pre-visualized. The entire thought process of creating a photographic image where the original scene is reproduced within the limitations of the photographic medium. The photographic medium is basically we are talking about the paper. When we do a capture, we are thinking about the paper that we are going to use to create the uh, the. the the emotional tone they are trying to create and the story that you want to deliver to. Ability and skills recording light, capturing data in your raw form is utmost, nonetheless, capture to print. In capture to print, you are talking about capture, tonality, and the medium. Photography is a creative art form. The performer engages and connects visually his thought process, interpreting a storyline to the audience. A personal experience will say something that resonates to my senses walls, aesthetics and spines. Now, um, looking at the subject, it should create an interaction between you and the audience. That's very important. The extent of slowing down, subtracting complexity is life experience and expression of art is a state of mind. Now, try not to be, I won't use the word greedy. Sometimes I fall to the trap where everything is nice. Less is more. Sometimes go for something less to get the message to the person that what you are trying to interpret, what you are trying to perceive, and how you interpret it. My solo exhibition, Yudaino Yama. Tika Chikawa, a queen low density town of 8,000, is just a very small den uh, density in the state of uh, Hokkaido. It is also a town named Town of Photography, declared in 1985, 33 years then. The only town of photography in the world promoting photo culture through active participation by the townspeople. 
It holds the annual Higashikawa International Photo Festival every summer, which has become known as a launching pad for the careers of young photographers. This is a mountainous region with alpine flowers, sweet scented herbs, and autumn's blazing leaves. Well, they can get to uh, Higashikawa 10 minutes from Asaikawa Airport and 20 minutes from the uh, station. I was there last year by invitation of a friend for his personal exhibition. And with that, I spent a week there trying to capture the uh, magnificence of the town itself. Later on, I'll just show you uh, some of the pictures. My first exhibition is 2011. I had a trip to Nepal. Uh, exhibition name is called Never Ending Peace of and Love. It is an outdoor activity of six friends I had. And um, we, when we came back, we mooted the idea of uh, having a joint exhibition. That was the start of my exhibition days. 2017, my solo with a total of seven, seven exhibitions I have uh, so far. Okay, um, pre-exhibition checklist. What I normally do is, um, I will, when I come back, I run through, I will uh, do a star rating of one to three. I'll select the three star image. Once it's done, I do soft, pro soft proving. After soft proving, I run through a check of tonality check. And then I will print the images on A3 paper. Put it on the floor, run through the sequence, how the story is going to be related. Once I'm happy, I do a visual uh, representation, followed by test prints on A2 paper. That is on the way for presentation to the audience. Then, I will look at the visual presentation, I will look at the tactile field of the paper, and look at the matching and framing. Installation will be at the gallery. My last exhibition, basically, I have a main exhibition hall and a print room. The print room is basically to inculcate the importance of printing. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you are doing your own printing or you coming up to a designated printer. It is fine, but at least you must know and understand each other, the printer and you as an artist. That's very important. And uh, with that, we need to have the tools. I should very, I don't have many uh, equipment. Basically, I got uh, two lenses for my digital which is a 35 and 100. I have a lot of restrictions, so I shoot not much. And uh, analog, I've just, I'm also using two lenses. Some pictures I want to uh, show you is uh, the exhibition I went, uh, I had last year, uh, is the town of uh, Asaikawa. On the left, we have the airport, on the right, it is the uh, town just in front of the gallery that we went to. Higashikawa is basically a mountainous area. They have a lot of hot springs and uh, water is portable. And as you can see from this uh, lady, is drinking from the source there. It is a very nice uh, place. This is in the Daisatsusen National Park. And um, at that time when I was there, it was late autumn. It's very warm, a lot of colors. And uh, one of the reasons why I came back to hold a solo exhibition is because I had a talk with one of the officials in Higashikawa and he mentioned that why is it so that people coming to Hokkaido, they don't stop over in Higashikawa. So it's okay. Let me go back and think about this. And I came up with the idea of promoting Higashikawa. This was the uh, pre-exhibition uh, days uh, with some of my friends. On the left is uh, Eric Paris. On his uh, right is, uh, on his left is uh, Jen Xiao, one of the uh, uh, 
top photographers, uh, commercial photographers in uh, AL. The next one next to me is uh, Romli Ibrahim, Dr. Romli. He's just uh, doing a, a visit to the gallery and see whether the place is desirable. The opening of the uh, solo exhibition And um, James is instrumental, actually, in um, my motivation into, I would say, professional photography. Way back in 2016, I had one of the exhibitions at the refinery. I don't know, I don't know James at, at, at the time. He came in like a bumblebee, very fast. And uh, he said, let me have three of your prints. I said, I beg my pardon. I wanted three of our prints. I was astounded. Eh? So I said, okay, since it is a joint exhibition, would you consider getting one each from my, all my colleagues? He said. So I said, yes, I'll leave it to you. That is the start of my relationship with James. It was very fun, very encouraging. And uh, if you can see from history, my first joint exhibition was 2011. I was in hibernation for five years until James came along. He took a print and I said, look, that's it. I need to have at least one every year, my solo. 2017, the next year, I had my solo. And thanks to, uh, to James. The presentation at the uh, Atelier, at Lens Place, uh, this one of the prints that uh, James bought. This was uh, taken in um, BA town during autumn. You can see the mist. This picture also in Higa Shakawa in the Susan National Park. Printed by my friend Mark. This is a canvas print of 6014 displayed in one of the restaurants in KL. One of our my uh, joint exhibition. This is the print that uh, James uh, took at that time without the 20% discount. <laughs> fortunately or fortunately, it was displayed there unknowingly. But I would say it is desirable, you see. To me, it's a very good caption. Probably uh, James had a very good intention to anything. But I think I didn't pay anything. This is uh, my first uh, joint exhibition for Nepal. Uh, we invited the uh, officials, the uh, Council uh, General of uh, Nepal, to officiate the function. The one on the on my right, with the uh, what I call the headgear, is the Council of uh, Nepal. Now I will show you some of the exhibition uh, images uh, that I did in uh, Higa Shikawa. Um, just a bit of a uh, Higa Shikawa. People, as mentioned uh, by uh, Barry, he's right. Uh, people take consciousness and they respect the environment, which we Malaysians should actually consider that. How I came back and I told myself I have to hold a solo exhibition. In fact, this solo exhibition of mine is never for Higashikawa. It's more of conceptual and contemporary uh, photography. But I divert to Higashikawa. What happened was um, this picture when I take it, there's always a pathway. With a pathway, there's always a, a perimeter for you to say, yes, you can be here, you can't be there, you see. And at the start of my journey in uh, Higashikawa, the national park, accidentally my tripod went, one of my legs went beyond the perimeter, just by two inches, and realizing that thing. One elderly lady came and told me to tap gently on my shoulder, Sir, your, your metal stand is beyond the limit. I noticed, yes, I uh, did not make compliance. So I said, my apologies to you. I took my tripod and put away. And that prompted me to have this uh, title is my first solo exhibition because people are conscious of what they have, they respect, and they want to conserve what they have. 
which I feel that all of us must emulate. Another picture, uh, this is somewhere in BA, or just how of Tiger Chikawa. Uh, I don't have much time actually to uh, really focus on my uh, images because not knowing where to go, I followed the uh, two of us. And normally it will only take about 15 minutes, some, sometimes five minutes stop. And I have to really pre-visualize what I want to take first. And these are the pictures I took of the landscape in Mist, also in uh, BA Town, in um, National Park. And I have a lot of limitations, uh, restrictions because uh, just having the 35 and 100 mm lens, a lot, a lot of limit, uh, limitations. I want to go nearer, I want to do a, 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 a study, I want to do a close-up, I can't because I cannot go beyond the perimeter. So basically, the thought process is very important. What you want to achieve and what you want to relate to the audience, that is a challenge for me. This picture is a known picture that everybody takes of BA. They call it the Blue Pond. At that time I went there, it was very flat. It was nothing at all. No lighting, nothing. And when I look at the water, they are known to have the turquoise, turquoise blue water. Straight away, it struck me. Black and white, black plastic uh, theory. The blue will be converted to black. And what we have is actually to maintain the dead tree trunks in white to create the black and white effect of black and white photography. This is how this picture came to be. This shot was my uh, first joint exhibition in Nepal, walking along a Bhakta pole. I saw this, uh, they call it the singing bowl. I did a shot of this. And uh, normally I don't shoot portraits much, but uh, because I don't believe in cropping, in post-processing, whatever cropping is, has to be during capture. And this, I have to walk pretty close to her. I was using a 50mm lens, and I shot her while she was walking by. Now, uh, I'd like to share with you this uh, adage by Lao Tzu. Nothing is softer or flexible than water, yet nothing can resist it. Be flexible in your life. When we go to a place, it may be famous for a rock. You don't see a rock. You shoot something else, you know. Many a times people always tell you, oh, I did shoot during golden hours. Yes, it is an opportunity. But move away from the opportunity, so it's very, very important. You have to pre-visualize. Create your image, a photograph into a 3D image by understanding light. Now, um, I want to ask yourself this question, you see. How would you evolve photography in the next five years? How would you evolve? What would you want to go for? How would you want to change? Or would you want to maintain status quo? Probably when you go back, think about this. And with this, I end my uh, sharing with you. Thank you. If there's uh, any questions you'd like to ask, I'd be glad to uh, read that as much as I can. Uh, I, I think at, at this point, uh, we shall maybe move on to the next presenter. Yes. Yes. But then again, uh, we could always come back to the questions of Mr. Choi very soon. Uh, next presenter is Ms. Teo, uh, but you'll be Presented by uh, John Key. Yeah. John Key will actually do the uh, actual presentation. So he still would be there to support uh, him to explain on her own works. Hi, a very 
Alright, good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is John K. Stahlager. Uh, I'm a portrait commercial and landscape photographer. Today I'll be presenting as a producer and curator for Miss Dio Chin Fen. First of all, I would like to thank our principals, Mr. James Law, the Lady Wu Miling, fellow members of the Malaysian Advanced Photographers who invested their Saturday papers. I would also like to thank our APG team who, without their collaboration, could not make this happen. Yes. Uh, uh, without further ado, it would be my honor and privilege to officially introduce to you our budding star artist, Ms. Teo Jin Fen. Round of applause. Light and shadow sets the platform for the mood. It moves people to wonder with curiosity. Light and shadow has a deep underlying mystery, the kind that makes people a desire to unravel. Alright, so uh, I would like to present to you the story of this Dio Jin Fen. She's a proud mother of two who helps her husband run a third generation coffee shop in a fishing village of Sunai Besar, north of Selangor. She was born and raised in Bagan Serai, a jetty village north of Perak. She has, her life has never been an easy one. Uh, as a child, her father fell ill, therefore could not help support the family. She began to work as part-time with her elder sister to lesser Many of her relatives believed that uh, this was her golden period to study hard, chase dreams and live her childhood life to the fullest. It was during this time of strife that she willingly made the choice to give up on her dreams of being a fashion designer in order to support her family. The year she quit school, her examination results showed that she was the top scoring student of her year. As a young, uh, she had chosen love for her family over her own aspirations as a young she had fully understood the weight of failure being. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Miss Teo's work experience have always been associated with crafted skills such as working as a hairdresser, needlework, and culinary. Today, as her children have all grown up, she began to reignite her passion in photography. Her works are intrinsically artful uh, and covers a sense of mystery that draws in the view. In many of her works, uh, there is an underlying story of her struggle and sacrifice. <clears throat> it is an idol and a symbol of never giving up. This is the journey of Tio Jin Fen, and I do hope you take a walk. Miss Tio Jin Fen had fallen in love with baking. In 2013, she started with a Nikon 3100. Uh, 
which we have sought answers from friends and other passing photographers. Her artistic direction and workflow minimizes, uh, uses minimal equipment. She is the master of light and shadow, and she believes that building methods of rules and separation are all good. However, sometimes you just need to paint outside the frame. I would like to talk about her artist inspiration. Through hard work and dedication and perseverance, her story and works took the eye of artist and art collector James Law and Milik. With his encouragement and support from fellow members of MAPG, Ms. Teo had decided to exhibit her works and not lose her confidence in her creative process. Her main inspiration these days is her own dedication to work. She aspires to improve herself on top of what she has created for you. She aspires to move. <coughs> she aspires to improve on top of what she has created for you. She challenges herself every time inspiration takes over. And her main concern is not to lose the self-doubt. Uh, Miss Teo colors a scene with light and shadow. Her play on those elements is meant to create an air of mystery. Uh, and hope to be able to draw out the viewer's curiosity to explore and unravel the mystery. Uh, setting her work with an appropriate setting it draws out the perfect viewers. Uh, for now, I'll be presenting some of Miss Steele's work. Uh, please have a look. The theme of her exhibition, uh, my placeholder, uh, we decided to call it light and shadow because there is a uh, uh, bit of paint. So I would like to talk a bit about her exhibition. Uh, we will be having in Bento's uh, place, uh, the refinery. Uh, we will have five walls, four pillars, and one centerpiece. Uh, one wall will be dedicated to the artist's profile. Uh, centerpiece will be larger than life print, A2 size. It's not often you see works of food that is made really huge, right? So four walls will be displayed of her sets and collections. Four pillars will be displayed where they can stand on their own or at least be smaller sets and larger prints. Um, or at least we have some uh, orientation that is vertical. So this is uh, basically how we plan to frame up our stuff. So I spoke to Mark and we decided to go with a lighter brown frame at least uh, so most of the art will be like this. And with, and with some uh, information from James, uh, we would like to also see something like this in our collection. And thanks to Titus, uh, this is how we play with light, uh, the gradation from shadows over to uh, the, the lighter parts of the scene. So I would like to talk about our primary goals. Um, why are we uh, promoting exhibition in this? Uh, we seek to improve MPAG artists that use photography as their main avenue of art. In this exhibition, our primary goal would be to promote and elevate the artist, Ms. Teo Jinfen. Our secondary goals do include sales of her art for decoration, uh, the exposure of the artist itself, for, uh, especially with the media, 
Miss Dills, uh, hopefully we can get some clients for her commission work. And also, uh, most importantly, it shows that we are able to collaborate as a group. So, some trivia about Miss Dio. Uh, I do believe that she is like this really rounded artist, uh, artist at heart, because she does calligraphy at her free time. If you were to take a look at it, you'll be blown away. It's really amazing. If you were to actually combine, combine her work of art as well as her calligraphy, it's just, it would just blow your mind. So, hopefully, you look forward to it. Yes, another cute thing about her, she was born left handed. But her mother asked her to please use your right hand. <laughs> yeah, don't do that to your children. So right now, um, when she uses her scissors outside of work, she uses her left hand. But when she's working, she does use her right hand to cut hair. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, are there any other questions? So if, let's talk about the one on the left and the right. Um, so the overall, so each print, say the um, the vertical print, right? Uh, how big would that be? Uh, we are planning to do it at least A3 size and A4 size. Okay. This would be A3 size. Okay. A3, A4. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, this probably will be A4, uh, A3 size, A4, A4, A4. A3. Okay. Okay. Um, we seek to sell. Uh, her, her art as a collection, right? So, um, three prints in one, or five or six. So, the overall size of the four columns, I mean, one frame on the left would be about how big is it? Um, I, I would say this is about A2 size and this is A1 size. Okay, yeah, spread across. 24, 48. Anyone else? Yes. Mm. Let me pass the mic to you. Hi. Yes, uh, Miss Chiu spoke about her work, about how she became a photographer. But would you mind uh, explaining to us how she took these pictures? Was it in the studio? What kind of lighting she used? You know, uh, from what I can see, is basically natural lighting. I think this is how we can learn something from her. Uh, yes. Aside from just saying how she became a photographer, you know. Yes. Uh, I'm quite. I mean, I would like to hear that if she can, maybe perhaps just explain how she do her works normally. Yes, I'll be glad to. Thank you very much. Uh, I realize that a lot of us are artists and photographers, and we like to nitpick the methods and the uh, ways, right? Like what camera she uses, what lighting she uses. Yeah, she does use a lot of natural lighting and uh, the great thing about this is even though the light comes from one source, uh, she does take care of the uh, background, the highlights, uh, ring lights as well as the feel using that one light source. So as fellow artists, can you really do that? Um, yes, yeah, she does do it uh, in between lunch and dinner, I guess, because uh, her husband does run a coffee shop and she helps out. So during those time is afternoon sun and she does it in the kitchen of the coffee shop. Yeah, and um, yes, she, yes. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, it's not so much of a question or yes. anything. Please, but, please. Uh, after seeing sales work for, from a viewpoint of a previous commercial, artist person, yes. okay, um, I used to work with them and all that, and we used to play with a lot of photographers and all that. I must only say congratulations to Monsieur. This is one of the best art directed works that I've ever seen. In my life, from having done, from products from Dunhill to Carlsberg to Richmond, she has one of the best works. Thank you. I thought I was good, but I looked at her. I used to work a lot with Jen. Right, um, anyone else before we close it? Can you share what is the tightness? Is it a special compact or is it a Oh no, it's a uh, 
it's the photographer who created this.